I believe, unlike my opponent in this race, I have laid that vision out here for you. On the fundamental requirements of the New Jersey State Government, it is broken, and I have the demonstrated ability to fix it. And I will fix it. There's no doubt in my mind that my candidacy is a winning candidacy. I'm the only Republican that can beat Florio in November. So I moved ahead, and we already have over 55 people on a finance committee. This is a grassroots movement because we're going to have the people of New Jersey take our government back. If you want to know where I stand on the Florio tax increases, ask the people who came together two years ago to protest those outrageous tax increases. I was there with them then, and I'm with them now. Good evening. The three major candidates in the Republican race for governor of New Jersey are about to face off in the first televised debate of primary 93. I'm Kent Manahan. Tonight's debate is also being carried on NJN Radio and by many other radio stations throughout the state. And we will rebroadcast the program at 4.30 p.m. tomorrow on NJN. In just a few minutes, we'll be taking you to Whippany in Morris County, where Michael Aaron will be moderating tonight's forum. But first, joining me here in Trenton, where we'll be keeping tabs on the sparring tonight, a couple of analysts who have been tracking Primary 93's campaign. Cliff Zugan of the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University, and David Rebovich, writer, college professor, and Trenton Times political columnist. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Cliff, if I could start with you, Whitman seems to be so far out in front, at least in most of the polls that we have seen. What do the other two contenders have to do tonight in order to begin to catch up, if they can at all? They have to essentially be much more aggressive. One of the old maxims of politics is when you're behind, you need to take risks. And that'll mean that Walwork and Edwards need to come after her to try and make something happen. And from her perspective, the other maxim is when you're ahead, settle down. Try and avoid mistakes, try and avoid controversy. So I think the candidates will have very different strategies tonight. David, yeah, think, how would you characterize the, the, what you expect to see tonight and, and what the campaigns have been so far? Well, I think Ed, uh, Cliff is absolutely right that Edwards has to contrast himself with Whitman quite clearly. His campaign has been very slow getting off its feet. He tells us that the last five weeks are going to be exciting and, and dynamic. Tonight's the night to emphasize his increased political experience, uh, his experiences in the Kane administration, and the fact that Christy Todd Whitman lacks government experience to serve uh, the people of the state of New Jersey. He must get that message out tonight. He must, but does the electorate really focus in on an event like tonight? We still have about a little less than a month to go in this campaign. They're really two different things. One is tonight is important not just for people who watch it, but for the headlines it generates tomorrow, and that's what we'll be talking about after the debate. But second is they're all starting their radio and television advertising, and that takes uh, the campaign to a different tier of the electorate, and that'll be a much more aggressive campaign, too. Right, and if the media says tomorrow that Whitman has done a very good job, Edwards and Woolworth failed to score points, I think what we're going to see is a relatively tame campaign from the Whitman, uh, from the Whitman camp over the next several weeks, and she'll coast to victory. That's why, again, Edwards or, or Woolworth really have to score We've this evening. We've heard a good bit about the blunders of this campaign. Do you expect to hear more of that tonight, Cliff? I think a little bit, but they haven't really registered with the public. I don't think we're going to see that tonight so much as we'll see that come up in their advertising, where they can't be responded to. I think we'll see candidates pressing other candidates tonight and making them defend themselves. And I think the format lends itself to that. The format lends itself to those who want to be aggressive. It allows them to do it. The blunder yes. that could be made tonight, I think, and I agree with Cliff, but tonight a blunder can be made. If Whitman can be shown to be... Uh, unspecific about public policy, lacking the kind of poise and expertise about government issues, then I think Edwards and Woolworth do stand to score some points. That's the key blunder, not the scandals that folks have been talking about. All right. Well, we are about to see who does score the most points in the actual event as it takes place tonight, and we are going to take you there to Whippany, Morris County, which is the site of tonight's first televised debate among the gubernatorial, the Republican gubernatorial contenders in primary 93. Michael Aaron is the moderator of tonight's debate. And Michael, we toss it now to you. Thank you, Kent. Thank you, Kent. Welcome to the first Republican gubernatorial primary debate of 1993. I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News. This debate is co-sponsored by the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce and NJN, the New Jersey Channel. 
We have an audience of about 500 people here for the debate. And let me introduce you to the candidates. Starting left to right, Christy Whitman, former president of the Board of Public Utilities from Oldwick in Hunterdon County. Jim Wallwork, former state senator from Far Hills in Somerset County. And Carrie Edwards, former state attorney general from Oakland in Bergen County. The format of this debate is deliberately loose and unstructured. The candidates are going to be free to interject comments when they wish, to respond to one another. They are going to have opening statements and closing statements. My job as moderator is to pose questions to them, to moderate the discussion, and to make sure that they get roughly equal time, or as best I can do. We're going to start now with opening statements, and by a toss of the coin, Mrs. Whitman goes first. You have 60 seconds, Christy Whitman. Thank you, Michael. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and NJN for hosting tonight's debate. I'm running for governor because I care deeply about New Jersey. And as I've traveled across this state over the last three and a half years, I've talked and listened to the citizens, and I've heard the fear in their voice, fear for the future. We must have change, but not change that's simply more of the same. We must have change that manages, that takes this government and creates a better government to manage. As I look to the future and look to the kind of government we want, I want to share with you over the, tonight my ideas for that kind of change. Change that brings people into the process. The kind of change that has, comes from leadership that's based on conviction and the courage to defy politics as usual. I come to this race with no IOUs, and when I enter the governor's office, the only thing that comes in with me is you, the people of New Jersey. Thank you, Mrs. Whitman. The next opening statement goes to Carrie Edwards. Michael, thank you very much, and uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce, NJN, for uh, having us all here this evening. This is one of the first and the beginning opportunities, I think, for we as candidates to begin to point out the real differences, I think, that exist uh, in this race between us. For this is an important race. The governor of the state of New Jersey is the most powerful chief executive uh, in this nation. The decisions the governor makes is about the life and death of real people. It's about people uh, on the streets of New Jersey who don't have a job. It's about the Smith family who uh, has lost their job and hasn't had work for a year and is having their house foreclosed. It's about Mrs. Flood from South Orange uh, who was shot and had her car carjacked. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's about children in schools who are growing up and, and graduating from high schools who don't have the education that they need to get a job and to really survive. So it's an important decision that you, the voters of New Jersey, have to make first in his primary and then in November. I have a plan for New Jersey's future. I have the ideas, the experience, and the capacity. We're here today to talk to you and to get your vote, and I hope uh, uh, you'll enjoy this program as much as I will. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Finally, for an opening statement, Senator, former Senator Jim Walwork. Uh, thank you, uh, Aaron. Um, ladies and gentlemen of New Jersey, I'm running for governor because I want to get government off people's backs and out of their wallets. I'm a conservative businessman, uh, and I'm proud to be a conservative because I want to have less government, less spending, and less taxes in New Jersey. I'm the only candidate pledged to repeal the $2.2 million billion dollar increase that Florio put on the taxpayers of the state of New Jersey. We can do that working together with a 4% cut each year in the $15 billion budget. And as a conservative businessman, I know I can do it. I know I can manage that. Beyond that, I want to have fixed terms for public officials. I think the 12 and out is very important to have the politicians go back to the private sector and live under the very laws that they've enacted. I want initiative and referendum to bring the public back into their government. People feel turned off by their government. We have to change that. Initiative and referendum will do that. I want a free market system for automobile insurance competition so that we can make sure that the automobile insurance program is a good one. I have to stop you there, okay. Senator. The 60 seconds are up. All right, now we're going to start talking about the issues, and we're going to start with tax and fiscal policy. And again, by a toss of a coin, Carrie Edwards gets the first question. The $2.8 billion that Governor Florio added in taxes that Mr. Walwork alluded to a minute ago, have been the central fact of political life in this state for the last three years. We heard Senator Walwork say he would repeal the whole thing. Mrs. Whitman has said it's a goal of hers to repeal the remaining $2.2 billion. 
you want a small cut in the income tax, but you have not pledged to roll back the entire remaining $2.2 billion in taxes. Is that because it's unrealistic in your view? You have to take the world where it really is, Mike, and uh, the world today is different than the world of 1990. We have the highest unemployment rate in this nation, the worst economy in this nation. Uh, we've got uh, fear on our streets and a school system that's failing. We have to create jobs in New Jersey. We need growth in order to be able to stop the gimmicking spending that's going on right now uh, in order to balance our budgets as the Constitution requires. My plan is to cut taxes and cut them now. We can't afford to wait till a new governor is elected because those tax cuts won't be effective till January of 1995. That's a day late and a dime short. Four taxes, a reduction of the income tax right now, a research and development tax credit right now, an investment tax credit right now, and a, and a reduction in the, in the double taxation on small businesses. That, I believe, and the legislature has said they plan to cut $500 million out of this budget, and I think they should do it now. I'm not making promises. These aren't goals. These aren't objectives. The public will be able to measure the effectiveness of my policies and programs, and they'll be able to do it on November 2nd with those policies and programs in place if I can continue to convince the legislature to move in that direction. All right, let me ask Mrs. Whitman, you have said it's a goal. Absolutely, is, because I is, believe very firmly if you don't have goals, you don't institute the discipline necessary to get there. We've seen what's happened to New Jersey over the last three and a half years because of these tax increases. There's no question in my mind about that. But there are two things we have to do in order to meet this need. We have to both cut government spending and the size of government, and we also have to increase and stimulate the private sector. The public sector is not going to create the kind of jobs we need to make New Jersey strong again. That's going to come from the private sector, and the private sector can't do its job until government gets out of the way. That's what's got to happen, and that's why it's a goal. Well, let's start hearing where we're going to cut government. Senator, you're the one who's pledging to roll back everything. Give me some big ticket items that you're going to cut out of state spending. Well, first of all, Michael, I'm the only businessman running in this race. I'm the only one that's provided jobs in the private sector because I've run a business successfully over the last 25 years. So I've dealt with the bureaucracy. I've dealt with the Division of Taxation, Department of Transportation, the DEP. I've removed tanks out of the ground. So I know what is strangling the businessmen of this state and the businesswomen, and that's the unnecessary rules and regulations. The day after I'm elected governor, I'm going to have a task force of qualified men and women, and we're going to strip out all the unnecessary rules and regulations that are stifling business name here in the one, state of Name New one regu regulation you'll do away with. Well, in the, in, the, in the DEP, as an example, I was talking to a restaurateur down in uh, Monmouth County. He was fined $16,000 because uh, his engineer made a water quality inspection late a month late, there was nothing wrong with the water, but he was fined $16,000 and $90 for the test. This is outrageous, and this is driving business out of the state of New Jersey. Now, what I intend to do is to have a grace committee type of task force to ferret out waste and mismanagement in government. That's the first step. Uh, we had the governor's management improvement program in 1984. A $1.5 billion was put on the table in cuts in state government. Only a half a billion was made back in 1985. That will be the beginning of my formation of how we're going to reduce taxes and reduce spending, and that's what we have to do to stimulate private sector jobs. Mr. Edwards, you want Michael, to jump in? Michael, uh, the executive branch of state government is a 65,000 employee, $15 billion service business. It's too much and we're taxed too much. It's not efficient, it's not effective, but nobody knows where to cut it. We know there are 1,500 middle management employees that have to go, but nobody can tell you which employee has to go. We know we got a sweet potato council and we got a white potato council. We know DMV regulates golf carts. That's ridiculous, but those aren't big numbers. We need to do, and Texas did this, they installed a performance auditing system of an auditor chosen by the taxpayers, the same way a private business does. A private business, the auditor for that business, permanent, not commissions. Every new governor's got a commission. Every new governor's got an audit. Institutionally, we need to know exactly what things cost by putting a performance audit in place. Now, I have called for the direct election of a state auditor. There are 1,500 middle management people I'll cut out. I'll cut 10% of direct state services at $460 million. But I want facts to do that on, and I want facts here every year. Texas cut. 
of its, of its $30 billion budget. If we do that in New Jersey, it would be $1.5 billion, and it should be done every year, you, just as a business. Let me stop you there and turn to Mrs. Whitman. You're all calling for audits, and you're all calling for cutting no, I'm fat. Not, I'm, I'm, not going no, I'm not it calling for an audit. I'm going to audit. use the line item veto as governor. Well, that's nice, but I believe we Where have got to... Where are you going to, to cut, and what do you think got, of the elected auditor's suggestion of Well, as you know, efforts? Michael, I believe that that is a traditional kind of response to the problems we have, which is adding another layer of government. It we is. have all the tools we need right now, Carrie, to do it. You can contract out to do audits. There's that's what needs to happen. There's right now. You don't know you what you're do talking it. about. Carrie, There's an excuse auditor. Excuse me. Five million dollars government. we pay for. <laughs> well, then why don't you get him to do his job? It, well, we can do outside, too. You want to put... Of course, it was a Republican woman in Texas, I will give you that. Republican women seem to do a pretty good job of cutting. But we have that's got right. to have, that's right, we have got to have, Maybe and that's what I've that called thing. for again and again, we have got to have that audit that tells us not just how much we're spending, but how we're spending it, where we're spending it, why we're spending it. We can sit here and give you all sorts of numbers. I mean, I could say that if you put 36% of Medicaid recipients into an HMO, you'd say $42 million a year, and that's a nice big number. But do we have enough HMOs to accommodate them? Is that creating a two-tier health system of health care? Those are the decisions, and those are policy decisions, and, and then you and can make the, Jim Florio, make the difference. Me, hasn't Jim Florio done an audit? Uh, no. 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 He, he's had a no. governor's we'll management review that. commission. It's a commission well. just like the MIP was a commission, just like Brendan Byrne had one, just like Bill Cahill had one, just like yes. Senator Walworth wants one. Well, I have one when I'm governor, but beyond that, Michael, here's the point. They we have, have a lot of politicians that are in jobs in state government today. You can start with the Violent Crimes Compensation Board, five people, each person on that board getting $80,000 a year. Uh, they dispense $3 million, but they're spending $2 million on their pensions and on their salaries. That board ought to be done away with as an example and let the money then flow to the hospitals where they can take care of the people who are victims of violent crime, stabbing, shootings, and muggings, and so forth. The Division of Consumer Affairs, they have 34 people in the main staff. They used to have 14. They have four people now in the Division of Consumer Affairs for public relations. They used to have one. We can, the job we, goes uh, on and on. We can find small, we can find small no, no, examples. Not Let's small. talk about it. Let me see We're going to go after the pensions. We're going to go after the political pension <laughs> system. The politician's pension program is like a golden trough. And that hundreds of thousands, millions You're of dollars. You're going to cut the pensions of legislators? No. We're, yeah, well, I like to uh, practically, but the political, look, the prosecutor of Essex County a few years ago gets $125,000. He was found on a legislative hidden payroll at $1,400 a year, building up his pension. The end of 30 years, you get the three highest years of your State service. Wait a minute. One hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars is sixty-two five hundred. Uh, okay, well, Mr. Edwards. Now we're going to go after those want, pensions. Then I want to change the subject. These there are, the, are vital, vital services the state of New Jersey renders. That's we not need one. to know in an that's not one, but we need to know in an informed way, which we don't so know, exactly where our tax dollars are being spent, so we can make informed judgments. And I've been there, believe me, and I've, I've made the mistakes, and I've had the successes, and I've reacted to the, uh, to the bizarre or to the scandal. But we don't have one measurement anywhere in state government that tells us what we get for our tax dollars, and we need that institutionally so the public can make an intelligent decision. Jim Florio cut across the board. He didn't have a state police class for three years, and crime goes up because he cuts we'll, across the we'll board get, because we'll we can't get, do it with this. We'll get to crime. Do you want to make I want one about crime? I well, yes, because a, another cut. part of what you've got Life to do is people. you've got to have performance-based budgeting. We have got to set up some way so we can judge are our agencies doing for us what we want them to do for us, not to us, which they think they ought to do to us. And we've got to have measurable standards so that each year we're funding agencies not on the basis of failed programs, but on successes. And we have got to look where we can introduce the private sector into government for competition and privatization. That's where you're going to have the biggest savings over time. Let me ask another. Michael, fist, let excuse me, me Senator. Sure. I, want to, I want to move forward. Let's talk about some of the big ticket items that the income tax hike went to fund, like school aid. If you're going to repeal the rest of the Florio tax hikes, are you going to cut back on school aid or on municipal aid? Senator Walwork and Mrs. Whitman. 
Well, we're spending enough money on schools in New Jersey today. The problem is we're not getting 100 cents on the dollar. Are you going to cut back on school aid, Senator? I know we're going to. I think that we're going to have to audit into the urban school districts and all the school districts to make sure that the money is being spent wisely and well. I want to make sure that the money is reaching the classroom. It's being siphoned off in the educational bureaucracy in the city of Newark. And incidentally, I represented Newark for eight of my 16 years in the legislature. They have a $535 billion budget. 85% uh, of that is coming from the taxpayers at large in New Jersey and from the uh, federal uh, monies. 15% from Newark. We're paying for an education, but the kids are not receiving the education in the classroom because of the educational bureaucracy. I think the state should step in and take over at least the bureaucracy and straighten the mess out and help the kids in the classroom and get the, a good student in the classroom with a good teacher and a good well, principal. Well, I was going to raise that later, but as long as you've raised it now... Well, we want to, and, and we have to involve the parents. As long as you've raised it now, Carrie Edwards, where do you stand on the state taking over the Newark schools, something that's being talked about very seriously right now? Well, if the school system is failing, we put a system in place in the state of New Jersey years ago to take them over. There are measurements to that, and the Newark school system that doesn't pass, it should get taken over. If it's failing to, to meet the needs of the kids and it's politicized and it meets those criteria, they were very carefully put in place. And as a matter of fact, I gave a legal opinion back in, uh, in 1987 about the powers of the state to do that. But the issue is that $11.1 billion of the state budget, of a $15.7 billion budget, is state aid. The direct state services are only 4.6 of that. If you're going to reduce $2.2 billion, you've got to get it from state aid. You've got to cut right. school aid. But you've got to do missing, it. I believe we're also missing a point here because we're not going to cut our way to $2.2 billion. We have got to see economic growth at the same time. That's why it's so important that we have the kind of regulatory reform that stops strangling our business, that we provide the tax incentives that encourages small business to start up in this state and keep the businesses we have here Christy, in this state. if you feel that way, why don't you support do the tax cut now? Carrie, An income tax, a business it. tax right. cut right now. You said you don't support that. Well, I never do. Carrie, you keep putting words in my if you mouth. You've done growth, it about 15 times. Well, I never said I didn't support excuse that. Excuse me one second. I, haven't said I, that. I do want to hear from Mrs. Whitman on whether you oppose or favor a state takeover of the Newark school system. I would favor a state takeover of the Newark school system if that system has not met the criteria set up that provides for state takeover. And as you may know, this administration even changed the steps necessary to get to the takeover uh, procedure and made it more difficult for the state to take over. So if the reports are as bad as I hear they are, then we are about, education is about our future. We cannot worry about whether it offends somebody's feelings to take over that system. We've got to make that system work because that's our future there. Michael, and, Michael there's no Senator. ands, ifs, or buts. The system is failing. It's got to be taken over. At least the educational bureaucracy cleared out. Everybody knows that. Everybody's waltzing around. I'm the only one to take a position, and I said it two or three weeks ago, that the, that the Newark public school system should be taken over. But I think we do want to come back to the jobs and the economy end of it, because that's really the taxes, the high taxes that people are paying. And uh, tell me, uh, because as a business person, I know we can cut the budget. I had to do it when I ran my business, and I know every working family in New Jersey's had to do it. Christy Whitman, when she was freeholder in uh, Somerset County, took the budget from, 40, from 50 built million up to 95 million. And the tax and rate went down well, for the five years. And the, and the reason the budget, the, 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 my the tax, tax rate went down, uh, Carrie, and that's uh, why uh, it went uh, up. Uh, one at a time. I, one at a time, please. I, I live in Somerset County, and it didn't go down. Yes, I have a business did. in Somerset like to, County, and I pay my taxes. You know, for, for two me, businessmen, two Nobody's people. tax bill went down. <laughs> the tax, the county tax rate went down. And what happened was people, nobody's tax bill went down. Property values went up. That's what happened. What hasn't happened in this state in three and a half years. Michael, 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 they did such a good job in the freeholders. They raised their salary four times in five years, and Mrs. Whitman voted four times to raise her salary from, I think it was 13000 up to $16,200. Well, the other thing I like about this, Jim, is, is you say that, that we raised taxes, and the tax rate did go down. You may not no, like it, it but it did. Mine didn't. Well, but if that, if that is something bad, that may be where you live. I can't say about that. I don't have but, a farmland assessment. Well, you should if you have a farm. But, 
Don't Whatever. forget, Jim, what is your response? I mean, you raised taxes. You voted for six out of eight possible tax increases in the year 72 and 73 when you were there in the legislature. Well, I was, there 16, the I was there 16 years, Christy. Six so, out of eight taxes well, you voted to raise on well, small what about, business. What about so the what's other, the difference? What about the other 14 years? Well, you didn't get much I pass, have a record, so I don't know I have those. a record down there of being a very hard-line person. I fought the income tax every inch of the way when Byrne finally put it through. I had a 79-point program, and some of those programs, incidentally, uh, Michael. Uh, Michael, are very good today uh, because I had the two-step bid process that Florio is talking about now for professional Michael. services. Right, we, we may get Michael, to that, too. I have Harry said Edwards. very specifically what taxes I want cut and how much I want that cut to be and how much I want that cut in spending to be, and it needs to be done now. This state is sick. It's broken. It needs to be fixed. We can't wait to elect any of us, Governor. It's not pie in the sky. I'm not proffering what some goal or some objective. There's a major difference between myself and Mrs. Whitman on this particular issue, and she won't acknowledge it. All right, and she should let's acknowledge it. Let's get a last wait, word wait minute, from Mrs. Minute, Whitman then on this the, subject no. before we change the subject. I want to hear what the, the difference is, I, I because, uh, right, what is you the know, difference? I support the R&D tax credit, the, and I have for ages. The difference is, I said the S-Corp very, very clearly. And those are pieces of legislation, you know, that are working their way through now. And I'm not afraid to give this legislature, the Republicans in this legislature, the credit they deserve for putting those things on the table. They've been there. And they're in working January, their way now. When, in January, when Governor Florio announced his budget, I called for those four taxes to be cut because this economy was in trouble and we need growth and we need to move it forward. We can't elect to wait, a new, uh, wait to elect a new governor. Christy Todd Whitman said we should not pass those taxes now. We should put that money into surplus because we're using gimmicks to move the budget forward. Well, you ain't seen nothing well, yet. Well, I know. You did agree she with has to sit down, taxes in principle. she has to sit down, as I did, in the middle of a recession and draft the budget when revenues are in fact falling. And I've had to do that, and right. she has Well, right. listen, I'm sorry, Michael, Senator. Senator, I'm sorry. I, I want to move on. To, I'm going to pose. Well, can I just right, make go one ahead. Very point. quickly, one, one quick point, because, you know, Christy talks about targeted tax cuts. I'm against targeted tax cuts. That's an elitist type of an approach to government. What we need are tax cuts across the board. As a conservative businessman, I know that people want a level playing field. They want to make sure that they have certainty. Targeted tax cuts are not good. It's the liberal way. That's what Bill Clinton's proposing down in Washington, and uh, I'm against it. I think we want tax cuts across the board for business, and we want it for the working right. men and women. Let me move on. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about education. If we're not going to cut school aid, if we're going to cut taxes, but we're not going to cut school aid, let me ask you, Senator Walwork, what are you going to do to improve public education in the state of New well, Jersey? Well, I, I think, uh, Michael, that the attitudes are just as important as money. And I want to see uh, talented teachers in the classroom, and I want teachers given the opportunity to teach. There are too many stifling rules and regulations, even imposed by the state, on, on the teachers' uh, programs teaching. So we're going to change the rules and regulations and let the teachers uh, teach and let the principals do what they should do. But we have to have an outreach program to reach into many of the urban centers, especially in other places around the state, because kids are coming into the classroom not in a frame of mind to learn. And that's bad, because we have to involve their parents. We, kids need to have parent backup. They need to have reading at home. They need loving care at home. I want to change that with an outreach program. I want to have a program for teachers where we can reward successful teachers and give them a bonus or a type of an incentive. And we have to cut down on classroom discipline and, and make sure we have good order in the classroom, Let me stop, too. You, stop you there and ask Mrs. Whitman, why would the public schools do better under you than they have under Jim Florio or, oh, any, or either of these other gentlemen here? <laughs> that wouldn't be very hard. The first thing we have to do is take politics out of the public education system. I have called for and I have a blueprint for better education in the state of New Jersey, putting the, the uh, commissioner back on a five-year term to get it out of the political cycle. And then we have got to establish core curricula standards so it doesn't matter whether a child goes to school in Princeton or Patterson or Passaic, they get the same basic level of education and that education is good enough that after four years of high school, they don't just get a piece of paper. 
they, have, they are able to go out and either get a self-supporting job or go on to further education and be mainstream because that's where we're failing our children and we've got to be willing to test to that and hold them accountable. Right. There's enough money in the system to pay for good education now, but we have not had any accountability. I think that's a difference between you and Carrie Edwards, so I want to hear Thank Mr. You. Edwards respond. You, you propose a statewide core curriculum and I think your education plan calls for letting all the decisions be made in the local school districts and returning all decision making to the local districts. No, not at all, uh, Mike. I think there's a fundamental difference between the two of us. I've been around long enough and experienced enough in the education world to know that the Thorough and Efficient Education Act of 1976 and how it's been implemented has not been a success. We need fundamental change and I invite the listeners here and the people in this audience and people all over New Jersey to read that program carefully. It is about converting from a state-run school system with mandates coming down to the state helping each district and each neighborhood in this state design a unique school to meet the character and quality of the kids in that neighborhood. The kids in the Central Ward in Newark are different than the kids in Short Hills. It is a program, it is a, a fundamental change in education in New Jersey. I understand how the public school system works in the state. I'm not for a voucher program to start paying uh, for private school students across New Jersey. We can't even, <coughs> we can't even agree on paying uh, what we should pay for, for well, public let's, school let's, students. Let's, it's a fun, but it's very important, Mrs. Michael. On that, it's then. a fundamental difference. And it, it, it takes some insight and some ideas and some understanding of how that public school system works. And frankly, Mrs. Whitman doesn't understand how our public school system works. Mrs. Whitman. Let's try to keep the applause to a minimum if we can. M Mrs. Whitman, Mr. Edwards raises vouchers. Right. Your education plan does call for a pilot program. Pilot program of in vouchers. And where, you know why, where, Michael? Explain, explain you why know, you're for that. You it's know very why I'm for that? Because I've too, I believe in choice within the public school system. The most important thing we've got to do is ensure that our public school system is the best it can be. And I believe that choice in the public school system really can make a difference. We have it in three, municipal, three districts here in New Jersey, and it's working well. But the reason I support vouchers as pilot projects in special needs districts where desired, i.e. in Jersey City where Brett Schundler has asked for that ability, we ought to let him do it. And that's in response to what I've heard said to me from mothers of children in special needs district in Newark, for instance. A mother said to me, it doesn't do me any good if you give me choice within this public school system. The whole system's failing Doesn't me. it hurt the public schools if you go to vouchers? That's the criticism of vouchers. Well, you have Milwaukee where it's been used. You have Indianapolis where it's been used and the public school systems haven't, been, haven't gone downhill. You even have the state of Maryland, which for the first time in this year's budget is including vouchers. It's worth trying because our, our systems are failing. I should explain, I should explain I, for our yeah. children. I should explain that vouchers enable children to go to private, private or religious schools, schools right. at public religious expense. Based Senator well, Woolwork, what's your position on vouchers? Well, Michael, uh, as a father of a daughter who went through the public schools and a private school and attended college here in New Jersey, I've seen the gamut. And uh, I want to make sure that the parents and the students have as many opportunities as they possibly have. Uh, certainly, I think all of us uh, can agree that we would have a voucher system for the public schools and I don't think that that would be bad because I think that the teachers and the students would gravitate toward a good school and if you had a bad school then you'd change the principal, put a good principal in there to straighten that school out and bring that school that the people were leaving uh, to a, a, a good quality. Uh, so far as I'm concerned on vouchers for uh, uh, religious schools and private schools, uh, I'm a firm believer of initiative and referendum. I think that that should be debated and I think that's a good opportunity for the public's voice to be heard as to what they want to do in a program like that. And as governor, I would certainly uh, want to uh, hear from the public on how they want to do a, pr a voucher Michael, for in, private in two, schools. In two more minutes, what's the central difference between you all Michael, and your approach to public very schools? Simple. I want choice in public schools, but I want to use charter schools within the public school system to do that. I want the teachers and the principals and the parents to work with the State Department of Education and the Commissioner of Education to design a unique school for that system and then put a charter school in that special needs district in the public school system that's chartered based on how that community would design a school if it could. 
and let those two sit there and compete. I do not, and it is a disaster. Mrs. Whitman wrote a column two years ago opposing choice when George Bush was proposing it nationally. Now she's for choice, for vouchers in the, in the public schools, to, in the private school system. That's just wrong. That destroys public education in New Jersey. My kids go to public school. One of them has already graduated from there. We as a people in this state must protect the integrity of that public school ed education system and make it work for kids. I want to respond. Do you want to respond? I'm very you glad. Respond? Please. I'm do you want to respond glad. to that? And, yes, and, and I'm very glad, Carrie, that you brought up that because that's where my heart is. I have always been concerned about supporting the public school system. That's the most important thing. But Maybe we you have vote got in the to. Public school election. Well, you might do it regularly too. Try general elections and primaries too, Carrie. <laughs> they, those those help. But we have got to support the public school system. However, I have talked to enough parents within the public school system who tell me, you're doing me no favors if you don't let me. Choice within the public school system, if the entire system is failing, doesn't do those parents any good and doesn't do those children any good. And that's what this is all about, Mr. the Mr. children. Mr. Stan Charter School. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's time to move on. Let me make one too. final comment Very because quickly, I don't think please, I've had enough. As a business person, I know how important it is for people to have the basics in education. If I have a person coming in employing, to be employed, if they're strong in reading, writing, arithmetic, the basic skills, Business and industry can train those people. So I am a firm believer of giving kids in the early grades special attention so you can build a good firm foundation in the early grades. As soon as those kids in the first, second, and third grade can uh, have success, they can build on success, build on a firm foundation, then we get them going in the right direction. So I'm an advocate of early special attention to make sure that we're building on a good solid base and then grow from there. All right, Senator. At this point, let's turn to crime. It's another issue that the three of you have been talking about. Two of you have put out detailed plans to attack crime, Mr. Edwards and Mrs. Whitman. And Mrs. Whitman, let me begin with you. Mr. Edwards says that because he was the chief law enforcement officer of the state of New Jersey, he has more expertise in this area. Would you acknowledge that he has more expertise and might do better at reducing the crime rate, which I think everybody agrees is too high. Well, Michael, uh, he has said repeatedly that if he can't bring down the crime rate, I mean, that, that's what his goal is. He shouldn't be governor. And if you look at the time when he was, in fact, the chief law enforcement officer of the state of New Jersey and look at the New Jersey Unified Crime Reports, crime went up 9%. In fact, in the last year that he was Attorney General, the murder rate was the highest it had been since 1980. So that if that's the only judge, I think there's a real question there. Kerry has repeatedly attacked uh, my association with something called the National Council on Crime and Delinquency and as a think tank. And I'm very proud to have been part of a think tank because you need to start approaching these issues and looking at them from a wide perspective. Members of that board have included Lee Brown, whom I served with, who is now the drug czar and the former and the, the wife of the late, recently deceased United States Supreme Court Justice Stuart Potter. It's made up of judges and law enforcement officers. It's made up of people who are part of the system and people outside the system that say it's not working and we have to figure right. out you've ways raised, to solve you've it. You've raised two points that warrant And that's why I support rebuttal. the death penalty. I support boot camps for first time offenders. I think that is very important, and I would appoint judges who understand that their responsibility is to enforce the law, not to write the law. All right, let's get, let, I'm sorry, we'll get to you, Senator, but okay. let me get Carrie Edwards to respond to crime rate going up 9% while you were Attorney General and murder rate uh, at a record high in your final year, and also to uh, why, you, you, why you've attacked uh, Mrs. Whitman's membership in the National Council on Crime Well, I think and Mrs. Whitman should come out of her think tank and out of the hills, the far hills in, in, in Somerset oh, County and down into the streets where I grew up. I grew up in East Patterson, New Jersey. I've arrested people, I've prosecuted people, I've run that criminal justice system. I understand what the problem in crime is in New Jersey and I don't think my opponents do. And I don't think they really understand it. During the years of the Kane administration in which I was setting the criminal justice public policy of the state and as Attorney General, the crime rate per thousand on uniform crime reports went down 14 percent in this state. We were making real headway and I want to finish that job. So her numbers are her wrong. Her numbers are wrong. She's going on raw numbers. Report. You have to add the population. It's, it's, it's numbers of crime. 
But I'm not going to argue that crime is out of control. What about the National the Council on Crime and Delinquency, which is a San Francisco-based yes, reform group? Yes, absolutely. That you have, they have you have in Hackensack. I'm Mrs. started in Hackensack. It doesn't matter where they were no. started. They have a philosophy that was rejected in New Jersey in 1979 when we passed the new criminal code, and that is that their first priority in sentencing is rehabilitation, and their second is punishment. We purposefully reverse that to make the first priority of sentencing punishment and the second priority rehabilitation. She believes in letting people go sooner. Sorry, don't More, try to talk about uh, what she I can't believe. change no for a, she can't change her position for an election that she's had for 23 years. She's changed and flip-flopped right, over Senator, and all right, over. All right, Mr. Edwards. Right, Senator, <laughs> let's let you in here. Okay. I got to uh, let me be in the middle. It's Go a ahead. comfortable position to be. As a as a um, uh, West Point graduate and a former Army officer, I served as a combat engineer, company commander over in Germany. I certainly know the military. I know discipline, and I know what needs to be done so far as crime is concerned. When I was in the legislature, I was the only senator that voted against Mr. Olentz's confirmation uh, to the Supreme Court Chief Justice. Uh, Mr. Wilentz has subverted the death penalty. Uh, I strongly support the death penalty. I support mandatory uh, uh, provisions for the career criminals. Uh, I've proposed, uh, because I know my military background, I know Fort Dix, that so we have a boot camp at Fort Dix, and that we take the, um, tra the uh, soldiers from Fort Dix, uh, the uh, ones that were the drill sergeants, and use them in the boot camp as role models and tough disciplinarians because I think that if we take 15 and 16 year olds and we can straighten them out before they come, become career criminals, so much the better and that's going to help things. So uh, I think that I have a, a good solid program, but I also want to see police out in the community interacting with community right. people to make Senator. sure that we can prevent crime. That's the most important thing. And the final thing I want to say, Michael, is we have to have good jobs provided for people. As a businessman, I know that a good job is number one in reducing crime and preventing crime. All right, Senator, Michael. Senator, excuse me one second, Mr. Edwards. S Senator, you said that you favor mandatory sentencing. And Mrs. Whitman, uh, Mr. Edwards says that- uh, For you, career you, criminals. For career criminals, that you uh, you were part of this organization that put re rehabilitation first and punishment second. You did come out with a crime plan yesterday. Right. It doesn't. Detailed. It did not call for extending no. mandatory sentencing as Mr. Edwards would for crimes against senior citizens. Are you? Called, why, why are you against mandatory extending called, mandatory sentencing? It called for increasing penalties. Well, you know, Kerry said it. I thought very well at one point. He said that mandatory minimums he believed were just a band aid to the problem. And what I call for is extending the penalties and letting the judiciary make the decision that's necessary to put those people away for as long as they need to be put. But we have to have some judicial discretion to ensure that you are putting in the cells of people who absolutely must be there because we need to ensure that we protect our citizens and our people. We have a terrible overcrowding situation now, and the worst thing in the world is to see cases come through and get plea bargained away because people are worried about there not being space for them in the, in the jails and the prisons. We have got to ensure that those who commit crimes serve their time. And we have got to ensure that we allow for, that's why I've called for extending the penalty on those who commit crimes against children and extending the death penalty to those who mastermind uh, right. crimes that end in a person's death, not just the person who wields the weapon. One thing here, Michael, on Mrs. Whitman's crime package, I think that she should retract the idea of putting a special license plate on cars for people that were drunk drivers or possible criminals. I think that's a bad idea. I think we that can agree the, to disagree. And, well, uh, look, I, and that's why I, that, those that things are the, proposal. I don't, I don't that's know why, why you have discussions. Well, that's why you put uh, ideas out. I'm not well, afraid to say if something should change. You know, well, I, that's, right. this that's is something a, that comes out, of, out last, of growth and discussion. Last word on crime, Mr. Edwards. Michael, <laughs> fundamentally, I have a very comprehensive crime package that's part of this plan for New Jersey's future that hangs together with the other two pieces. It basically says, and I'm going to draw a line in the sand, right now a kid on the streets of this state and, cr and criminals believe that they can break the law and if they get caught, they're unlucky. If they get punished, they're stupid. I will draw a line in the sand. And I can promise you this, the streets will be safer, crime will be reduced after four years of me being governor. And I'm going to take it one more step further. If I have not delivered on that promise, and I don't make many in public life, 
I will not run for re-election in this state. Yeah. But, right. Excuse me. That, that was the last word on crime. Okay. <laughs> I, I want to turn now to the subtext that has gone on in this campaign over the last three months, the question of electability. Republicans want to nominate someone who can beat Jim Florio in the fall. Jim Florio may not be so easy to beat in the fall, or you may disagree with that. Mr. Edwards, you've said that you're the only one of these three who can beat Jim Florio in the fall. Do you really think so? And if so, why? It's a very serious business, Mike, running for governor. And the public in a general election, uh, when all seven and a half million people are engaged, have a way of discerning the difference between those who can govern and those who can't. We in the Republican Party have historically made very bad choices about people who can and people who can't. It is a very serious business and it's a life and death business. I believe that uh, being governor of this state requires experiences in life. I grew up in a single parent household. I've worked through high school, college, law school with scholarships. I know what it's like to struggle in this state. I've also been in involved in business, Jim Walworth to the contrary's opinion notwithstanding. And I've been involved in every level of government. I've done some things right and some things wrong. This is a 65,000 employee, $15 billion service business. It's not a job for amateurs, and it is about life and death. And I sincerely believe that my opponents in this race have very different positions than I do, and I sincerely believe those positions are naive. I don't dislike them. I don't think they can run against an incumbent <laughs> governor. I helped Tom Kane set up the power of the incumbency, and I've seen it wielded. The communication power is awesome. Jim Florio is the most skilled, mechanical politician that's ever come on the scene in the state of New Jersey. He is going to be difficult to beat in any day, at any time. And Republicans are at a disadvantage. And I believe we should put forth our most experienced candidate in life, in business, and in government stop you. because it's not a job for amateurs. Let me stop you there and ask you, Christy Whitman, why you feel that you're best suited to run against Jim Florio. Well, one of the things that, that Carrie said is this is not a job for amateurs, but I would argue that part of the problem we've had over the last three and a half years is that we've had professional politicians running the show, and that's part of the problem. You know, we bring different experiences, different life experiences to the perspective of governor. Uh, Carrie sort of maintains that, or implies, I guess, is a better way of saying it, that I don't have experience. And uh, clearly, I do. Management experience, having been a, as a freeholder, I know government at the local level. I know it at the state level as having been president of the Board of Public Utilities. I bring my experience as a mother. I bring what I've done for the last three and a half years, listening and talking to the people of this state. You bring different experiences to it. What you have to have is the real commitment to change. I know what works in government. I know what doesn't work in government, and I know we can change it. Believe me, I know we can do it, but it does take the kind of leadership that's dedicated and understands it isn't me. No one individual, no one party has all the answers. It's going to take everybody out here being part of the process, and you have to be willing to really commit yourself to that kind of an open government. Right, let me ask Senator Walwork to comment on the question in, in this fashion. You jumped into the race after your two opponents disclosed that they had hired illegal aliens and had failed to pay taxes on them. And you said at the time that they were tarnished candidates. Do you still think so? And is that why you think you're the only Republican who can beat Jim Florio? Well, Michael, uh, look, I'm a businessman. I've run a business successfully for 25 years. Uh, so I've met a payroll. I have paid my Social Security taxes. Uh, I provided health care benefits. I know and I relate to the working men and women of the state of New Jersey. And what people want is they want less taxes, they want government off their backs, they want a conservative viewpoint, and that's what I bring to this race. Beyond that, I served 16 years in the legislature. So I know the nuts and bolts of state government. And I served eight of those 16 years representing all of Essex County, a highly urban county, 900,000 people. And as a Republican, I represented Newark, Irvington, East Orange, tough urban areas. I got Democratic votes, I got independent votes, as well as Republican votes, and I was elected, re-elected, and re-elected. So I'm a good campaigner. I don't take my hat off to anybody. And let me just add that I believe that my West Point training and my military background, served four years on active duty, 11 more years in the National Guard, a governor's a leader. And I have leader qualities from my military experience, my political and uh, 
governmental experience and my business experience, and I don't have the baggage that the other candidates have. Let me stop. So Florio cannot attack me. It's going to be an issue between liberalism and conservatism, less taxes, less and government, and bigger government. And Senator, when was the last time, when, when was the last time that a conservative won a statewide general election in New Jersey? It doesn't make any difference. The people, look, I am, I am conservative fiscally. And that's what the people in New Jersey want. I'm a conservative fiscally. I'm moderate on a lot of issues. We're all pro-choice here. That's not an issue. The issue is it's going to be clear cut. Do the people of the state of New Jersey want bigger government, more regulations, higher fees, strangling jobs and driving people out of the state? Or do they want a businessman who's conservative, who's going to have less taxes, less government, less spending? All right. Both of you gentlemen have suggested in so many ways, and even here this evening with your comment about public school and your emphasis on public school that because Mrs. Whitman comes from a wealthy background that she is somehow out of touch with common people. You've never implied no, that? it has nothing with, do, to do with the wealthy background. It has to do with the background. And it has to do with the real experiences that they had. Tom Kane was a very wealthy man. Um, but Christy Whitman is no Tom Kane. I knew Tom Kane. I worked for Tom Kane. He doesn't Kane. wear a skirt. Last I knew. Um, <laughs> you can, wealth is not the issue, which your real experiences in life. This is not a game of academics. This is life and death to people. This isn't about studying an issue. When a, well, I guess this is what I'll do. Uh, and maybe I'll change my mind next week, which he's done on a number of occasions. And I think it should be open-minded. I don't disagree w with, with the, the principles that she's talking about, the way she is, but she's not giving the voters of the state in this primary or the general election a specific vision about what she will in fact do on life and death issues Harry, in the state. I, I thought you'd and read my economic have, blueprint better than that because you have, using the phraseology She, she, she from doesn't it. have that background that's needed to make real decisions right, about education wealth, in New Jersey. It's, not, it's wealth. not wealth. It has nothing to do All with All three wealth. of you are relatively wealthy. It has nothing to do All with right. wealth. Mrs. Whitman, do you want to respond to the suggestion that has been made, if not by your opponents, then in the media, that somehow because uh, you come from inherited wealth, that you are out of Actually, touch. my husband has made what you saw we paid in taxes was stuff that my husband made. So he's been very successful as well. And, and there's no question that, that people are going to try to make this a class issue. And you know, that's something that's been happening to this state over the last three years. That kind of divisiveness goes back to the old kind of politics that we simply cannot afford to have. It's going to take people of lower income, middle income, and upper income to get this state back on track. It's not what you have in your bank account. It is what you have done with your life. It's the kind of experience that you get from teaching English as a second language, as my husband and I did in, in Harlem. When you talk and work with people who care so desperately about improving their skills so they can get jobs and be contributing citizens. It's spending the time to talk to the mothers whose children are in the intensive neonatal care units. It's holding those babies with AIDS. It's the kinds of experiences that l enable you to understand what really is driving the fears and the concerns of the people of this state, as well as talking to the business people who have lost their jobs. I talked to one fellow the other day. He had 80 employees when Jim Florio started as governor. He's now down to one himself. That's it. Those are the kinds of experiences that I bring to this. All right, so maybe the electability question is over. Does anybody well, want to throw, make any last comment about being the only one who can beat Jim Florida? No, but I just want to say one thing. I, I keep hearing that uh, this electability thing, and it, and it amuses me just a little bit because I keep hearing that, that I'm not. But it's interesting that I was the first to max out. I was the first to, I have, there have been five Republican conventions. I've won all five of them. I have the Hands Across New Jersey endorsement, and I'm ahead in the polls. Uh, the people are going to decide this at the end of the day. Christy, you haven't. Today, I got my final certification on maxing out, and she has maxing not out is uh, raising exactly. the maximum right. amount of money she, to she, qualify she, for the maximum amount of public matching funds. Go ahead, Mr. She Reverend. doesn't seem to be able to get her facts straight. It took Jim Corder till the general election uh, to to misstep as many times as Christy Whitman has misstepped since January. Believe me, she can't beat Jim Florio. Well, Carrie, one thing I'd like to say, though, you say I, I misstate. I would just like at any time misstep. Misstep, misstate, uh, and any time I would accept an apology for you from you for calling me a liar when I indicated 
that you had in fact filed for extensions on your taxes three of the last four years and pay, paid penalties and fines in four of the last four years. And you said I was a liar. And you said I didn't have my facts. And you implied that that was something that had been continuous. You know you did it. It was there. You filed, you only filed the first two pages, but you filed them and it said there. So it said there, unless you're working on a different fiscal year, Christy, October you set and the August are not there. You and didn't meet it. You set the standard. I, I disclosed. The reason you, you know exactly you what's even on mine is you have 11 years of my but tax But you called me a liar. Well, you have 11 you years. You called me a liar. Michael, and we uh, don't have your right. We're still waiting for your disclosure. Michael, you have ours. Look, all right. Michael, uh, Senator. Uh, so far as the, all the disclosures are, I was the first one to uh, uh, disclose my income taxes in 90, 91, 92 and lay it before the press. But uh, that's a side issue. Uh, Jim Florio is not going to be easy to beat. I think he's going to be a very formidable candidate. Uh, but I think it's going to be, it should be, a campaign on the issues because Jim Florio has done a lot of damage to the state of New Jersey with his high taxes, with his fines and fees in the various departments, environmental protection is the, is the biggest one, with his unnecessary rules and regulations. And you're going to have to have a businessman. I've lived under these rules and regulations. I know what they are. I'm really the only experienced person. Everything that I own, I, my wife and I earned. And so I know what it is because I bring uh, to this race um, a business experience, but I also bring legislative experience, and I know that I can go after Jim Florio on the issues. All right, if it's going to be on the issues, let us get back to the issues. Okay. Then. Let's talk about the environment, particularly as it bumps up against the need to create jobs. We have a situation in northern New Jersey, in Port Newark and Elizabeth, where Newark Bay needs to be dredged. The Port Authority and the shipping industry and the Longshoremen's Union say that business is disappearing because we're not dredging that harbor. At the same time, the mud in the harbor has dioxin, trace amounts of dioxin in it, and if it's dumped in the ocean where we normally dump dredge spoils, at the mud dump six miles off of Sandy Hook, environmentalists say we're going to contaminate the ocean and fishermen are worried about the fish. Let me ask you, without getting into the minutiae of that issue, Mr. Edwards, in general, in situations like this, are you going to give the benefit of the doubt to jobs or the environment? That isn't a choice that anyone could ever have to make, Mike. In 1988, I wrote a blueprint to end ocean pollution, not only in New Jersey, but across the country, based on the experiences I had. Somebody has to make it. I understand. Governor Florio could stop that I hear right you. now. I hear you. Um, and in 1988, that plan included an answer because the mud dump site was in place and the recommendation was there for Jim Florida to take. He also knew in 1989 that they had to dredge the harbor for jobs and to partake in this new global economy or a non-new global economy. It had to be done. That dredging has to take place and those dredge spoils can't be dumped in the ocean. We can't afford it in New Jersey. That 127 miles of beaches, that um, $18 billion tourism industry that's here, that I investigated New York's dumping that caused us so much trouble back in the mid-80s. That's where that blueprint came from. And I called for the closing of that, 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 that uh, mud dump site then, and we knew the port had to be dredged then, and there should have been an alternative put in place by a real governor who wasn't just giving you rhetoric, but cared about the future and would make the tough decisions. Jim Florio doesn't make tough choices. He makes political ones. You must dredge. If you've got to put it in a barge and test it and find out where you can do it, you've got to dredge that. The jobs are too important. Our futures, our families, the entire economy of the Northeast is dependent on that dredging. And whatever it costs, whatever it costs to do it that way, but we in New Jersey can also not allow those dredge spoils to be dumped off our beaches. All right. Mrs. Whitman, you want to respond to the question? <laughs> Absolutely, because uh, when I was down in Sandy Hook about two weeks ago, uh, cleaning up the, working on that beach cleanup there, you know, you can look out and you can see where they're talking about dumping that, that sludge. And you can't. We cannot allow that to happen. But we have to have the dredging. I agree. There is no question about it. We are a hub state. We have the ability to move our produce if we just free ourselves from some of the problems we have. Part of that is that super tankers can't get into our harbors because of the sludge, the way it is built up. I support the barge alternative because over a three-year period, I believe I've watched technology develop. We will figure out 
in technology. There's an experiment going up in the, on in the Great Lakes right now to try to clean sludge, to take out the dioxins. That's what we have to do. We have to have the dredging. We need the jobs. We have got to reinvigorate our harbors. At the same time, we absolutely cannot allow that dioxin-filled dredge spoil to be dumped off Sandy Hook All down right. there. S Senator Warwick, maybe this wasn't such a good question because they, they won't choose between <laughs> jobs and the environment, will you? Well, I, I, look, I don't think you have to choose between jobs and the environment. I'm a businessman, but I also served, I also served four years as chairman of the Senate Environment Committee, and I had a good record in the environment. Uh, there's no question in my judgment, dioxin is a carcinogen. You cannot dump it six miles off. The ocean is not a garbage heap. Uh, and we cannot uh, continue to dump things in the ocean. I'm for uh, clean oceans because that's vital to the economy of the state and it's vital to the healthy uh, well-being of the families that are bathing along the shore, as an example. And it's a magnet, of course, for uh, our uh, industry of uh, tourism. So uh, I believe that we have to seal the, this sludge in containers. And I would say, as governor, let the Port Authority come up with all their expertise and let's have a real open discussion as to what can be done with this dioxin. I don't think anybody really knows. I read in the paper today, well, there's only about as much dioxin in all the sludge that would fill a small little bottle about the, an eyedropper size. I don't know what the facts are because the Port Authority has really not educated the public. So I think we need the Port Authority to give us the expertise and the answer to the solution because we have to do the dredging but it can definitely not go into the ocean. All right, one Michael, more issue, subject. Very quickly, if you, issue, quick issues, response. The issue is much deeper than that, Mike, and it's not just the sludge dumping. There is a balance, and one of the toughest jobs of the next governor of the state is going to be to make that balance between the economy and our environment. Our regulatory environment is broken. It has to be fixed. I can fix it. We had to do that at motor vehicles, and I've got a record of doing it, but making those choices are the, one of the toughest jobs the next governor of New Jersey has to make. Right. We answered that one successfully, but there's hundreds of more out there. And believe me, the question is far more difficult than, uh, than just that one answer. All right. Let's talk about the bond business and competitive bidding. La last week, coincident with a federal investigation of the sale of New Jersey Turnpike Authority bonds, Governor Florio carried through on an old campaign promise and declared that from here on out, by executive order, all bond underwriting business from the state of New Jersey would be doled out through competitive bidding. Mrs. Whitman, would you continue that order as governor, and would you urge the legislature to make it law and extend it to all state, all county, local, and authority bonding work as well? I would certainly. Uh, vote. Uh, I would certainly, as governor, extend that, that order because every issuance of a bond, every issuance of a contract has got to be able to stand the scrutiny of the light of day. That's why, part of why when I went out before the Sports and Exposition Authority and called for its privatization, part of what I was saying is what happened in that bond extension that went on there was done, and this administration has done it over and over again, was done at 12.30 in the morning in the last days of the last legislature. Never went before the people. That hasn't happened before, and if it's not against and it's not the, the actual letter of the Constitution, it's certainly against the intent of the Constitution. We have got to stop this extension of bonded indebtedness that is more mortgaging our future, not managing it. The last one that was passed when we refinanced from taking a, a bond from 1.4 billion to 1.8 billion, you know, municipalities when they want a bond and want to refinance have to go and prove that they're making a savings of at least 3%. This was even just barely 1%, plus it extended it. We're going to spend over time between the years 1997, because we put off payment for a few years to make it look better, to the year 2017, we're going to spend over $650 million extra. We didn't gain anything from that. We've lost. And we have got to ensure that we submit all those kinds of awards of contracts and bonding to the people. They've got to know what's going on. It's their right. So Governor Florio did the right thing last week. He finally did, yes. A little bit like closing the barn door after the horse is out, but he did the right Senator thing. Senator Walworth. Uh, Michael, when I was in the state Senate, I had introduced legislation for a two-step program for bidding. And it would have included bonds, but it would have included professional services such as architects, engineers, 
public relations people. There's a whole, as, uh, whole area out there where it has to be reformed, not just the bonds, but in these other areas of technical uh, services I've just mentioned, plus others. I had a two-step type of proposal where you would make a bid and you, it would be a technical type of a bid, and only you would make that bid if you were an engineer or an architect or in the bonds, and then they would qualify that individual or that company and say, all right, now you're qualified in the first step. Those that weren't qualified would step aside, and now maybe you'd have three or four bidding, and then in the second step, you would only bid on your uh, proposal, and then whatever the lowest bid was with the best engineering or the best uh, result would be the, the winner. So it was a two-step bid. Governor Florio should take that legislation and put it before the legislature now. Had we done that in 1975, when I introduced it in the state senate, we wouldn't have this mess today. Also, I had a municipal bond bank bill quickly, in Senator. where you could have municipalities going into a central bond bank. You wouldn't have all the individual municipalities floating bonds. They would do it through a bond bank. It would be cheaper, would be more effective, and would eliminate a lot of this so-called political patronage. So I had the programs right. 15 years ago. All right, Senator. Mr. Edwards. Mr. Edwards, your law firm does do bond counsel work from that vantage point. What do you think of what Governor Florio did last week? Absolutely. Uh, the right the, thing. The right thing. He promised to do it three years ago uh, when he was running and, uh, and didn't install it. Uh, I represent my firm. I moved this firm to New Jersey. And ironic, I listen to Mr. Warwick as a businessman. I created 100 jobs over the last three years here in New Jersey, bringing a national and international firm. Yeah, but you've been running for governor for two years. A national so really and international have firm. <laughs> and I have not. I've been putting that law firm together. And maybe if I had been. Uh, this but I week, ran for 25 be years of business carriage. Anyway, let, uh, let, let, me, let me see if I can deal with the crux of the issue when, rather than Senator Walworth's raving. So the. Um, I do believe there should be open and competitive bidding. I do understand how the business works. Uh, my law firm, I think, is one of the national, nationally recognized finest public finance law firms in the, in the country. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud to have brought that firm to New Jersey. Um, and uh, we do about 55, 60 percent of our business in, in litigation and various others. Uh, but open and competitive bidding so we get the finest services for the least amount of money in public finance is what we need. Jim Florio promised it in 1989 and didn't deliver it till a week ago. We have increased our bonded indebtedness in the state of New Jersey by 40 percent in three years. It took us 200 years to get this far and we increased it by 40. We, are, we have become too dependent on bond and public indebtedness to finance our operations in the state of New right. Jersey. Very dangerous precedent. You agree with Mrs. Whitman on that point. Let's move on. We're rapidly running out of time. Let's spend about three or four minutes, if we could, figuring, figuring out which of the three of you can do the most for New Jersey cities which need help. Who? Well, I'll start on that because I represented the urban areas for eight of my 16 years in the legislature and I've sponsored a number of bills to uh, help the cities. I think, uh, Michael, the biggest uh, thing in the cities is having decent housing. It all stems from having a decent home environment, and that's what we have to provide. And as governor, I would be stressing, because we have the built-in facilities, we have the infrastructure, we must now uh, move back in and we must stabilize in these various communities, give people an opportunity to own their own home, urban homesteading, sweat equity, whatever the case may be, and I proposed this when I was in the state senate, to begin to rebuild in the neighborhoods in the urban centers. I would put my emphasis here, rather than trying to build housing, affordable housing, all over the state of New Jersey, I think it should be here where we can improve the environment. Uh, and, and improve the quality of life for people living right. in Newark and Jersey that's, City. That's one good then, idea, and I only have time for, for well, one thought had, out of each you know, of you on this. I'm not getting much time here. I, I, I'm <laughs> trying to keep it equal. Let's okay. hear what Mrs. Whitman would do All for right. the cities. The best thing that we can do for the cities is to get the state's fiscal house in order and provide the kinds of incentives to small businesses and job creation that is going to create jobs there so people will want to live in the cities. Repair the education system so they can feel confident that their children are going to get the education they need and not be handicapped because they're living in the cities. But the basic thing that we have to understand is that government is not going to do it all. 
It has to happen from within, and there are many people in each of these communities who care deeply about it. I've been part, as president of the Community Foundation of New Jersey, of something called Le Neighborhood Leadership Initiative. Department of Community Affairs was involved with that agency, with the Community Foundation in doing that. We brought people from these communities who had ideas. We gave them the training and skills they needed to be able to implement, and then gave them some dollars to be able to do it. Public-private partnership is another way to empower those people who really can live it day in and day out. I'm sorry, and really I, care. I have to stop you there, Mr. Edwards. A minute on what an I'm Edwards just, administration would do for the cities. They're both uh, uh, fundamentally missing the point. New Jersey and this nation has dealt with urban problems for over 30 years and we failed. No one wants to live in an environment or work in an environment that's not safe to work and live in. No one wants to raise their children in, in a in an, city or a town in which the education system is failing and no one can work and live in a place where there isn't a decent job. We need to get back to the fundamentals. All of these programs, government programs, are treating symptoms, not the virus. And until we provide safe streets and an education system that works, we're not going to solve our problems with urban New Jersey. And New Jersey is the most urbanized state in the nation. There aren't five or six cities, there's 50 of them. And it is the most difficult problem a governor and the next governor of this state can face. There, I have promised uh, at editorial Very boards quickly. around the state that I will deliver a detailed urban agenda and how I believe government should interface in that. Because only government can provide right. safe streets and run the education I have system. To, I have to stop you there. I'm, one, I'm one, sorry, one Senator. I'm sorry, Senator. I have one more question, and we only have time for one more go-around. Okay. It's an, an important question. I'll start with you. <laughs> Why me? What are the first two things, and you have, you have less than a minute to answer this, what are the first two things you're going to do as governor if you win in November? Well, the first thing I'm going to do before I'm sworn in is I'm going to appoint a task force of qualified men and women, engineers, experts, to go through every rule and regulation that we have in the state of New Jersey to strip out the unneeded rules and regulations because these are the rules and regulations that are stifling business and killing and jobs. And what's the other thing? The other thing is I'm going to go right after the budget. I don't have to wait, Carrie, for a year after I'm sworn in because the governor will be proposing a new budget in January or February. I'm going to use the line item veto. Whatever I have to do, we're going to cut. We're going to cut that budget, okay. and we're going to help people get jobs in the private sector. All right. Mrs. Whitman, what are the first two things you're going to do if you become governor in November? First thing is to I implement... I you governor in January. Go January. ahead. January. The first thing I do would be to implement the decisions that have come forward from the task force that I appointed the day after I was elected to do the performance audit of each and every, gov each and every agency and department within state government to ensure that we have government that delivers the services. The second thing I do is appoint that business and industry council that I have talked about to allow the business people to have input to the governor's office to start to point out some of the biggest roadblocks that are stopping development and stopping growth in the state of New Jersey. Mr. Edwards, what are the first two things you would do if you win the election? You have 21 days from the time that you're sworn in to uh, recommend a budget to the legislature. That budget will be both your spending and policy document. It must be jobs-oriented and reducing taxes. The legislature can't adopt that budget until June of 19 of that year, and, and those tax cuts won't be effective until January very of 1995. Quick, very quickly, the first two things you will do. The tax reductions are designed to move this economy in this state forward. The second thing I would do is put that auditor in place so I can fix the DEPE and let business grow and mature in the state. All right. <laughs> We're out of time for questions. We do have closing statements slotted for this point in the debate. And you each have 90 seconds, and by a toss of the coin, Mrs. Whitman, you go first. Well, I want to again thank the, uh, the, part, the, uh, the sponsors for tonight's debate, the Chamber and NJN, for giving us this opportunity, giving the voters this opportunity to see the various candidates. There are differences. There are differences in approach. There are differences in objectives and in goals. And we have got to understand that this state demands fundamental change. The focus of this has got to be, this state has got to be providing the jobs and the support for the people of the state of New Jersey. That's only going to come from a real commitment and understanding that the people deserve and are a part of that process. 
And that's why it becomes so critically important that as we look at the future of the state of New Jersey, as you the voters make your decision as to whom to support in this primary, you look to see where are the commitments to really doing things differently? Where are the commitments and the understanding that you have a role to play and that you have a right to be heard and you must be heard? Because together we can make New Jersey number one again. Not number one in taxes, not number one in unemployment, not number one in regulation, but number one in ideas, innovation, and growth. And that's what my focus is. The next closing goes to Senator right. Walwork. All right, thank you, Michael. You've done an excellent job here tonight, and so have the hosts, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, New Jersey's a great state. We have a lot of great people in our state, everybody. But uh, we've lost our way, especially over the last uh, three years under the Florio high taxes, the unnecessary rules and regulations. And I believe that we need a good conservative businessman to come in and make a difference as governor. Uh, the other day, my wife and I were visiting uh, in Hackenstown. And I came across a young woman, 26 years of age. She had two children. She was working, had her own little business, but she was struggling and her husband also had a job. He had been ill last year, and they had run up $1,100 worth of bills, uh, 11,000 rather, worth of hospital bills. She said, I don't know how I'm gonna pay for this. And I knew this was a good family because the two little girls were there. The seven-year-old girl had a reading book, and she was reading. And the young woman, the mother said, I never had an opportunity to go to college, but I'm going to make sure, no matter what it takes, that my two daughters will go to college. And my heart went out to this young woman because she's struggling. And she's just one of thousands of New Jersey people out there struggling, trying to make ends meet. And that's the challenge that we face. That's why I'm running for governor, because I want to work with the men and women throughout New Jersey, southern New Jersey, central New Jersey, northern New Jersey, all of us. We have a great state. I want to provide with you, working together, the leadership. And I promise everybody I will be a governor you can be proud of. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. The final closing statement, 90 seconds, Carrie Edwards. Michael, thank you very much, and uh, thank the Chamber of Commerce and NJN and uh, the people in this audience and our listeners out there who uh, have been watching this program. I hope this program has given you all an opportunity to get more insight into what this election is about, how important this election is. Uh, that it is an election about electing a governor who will make life and death decisions for the future of the people of New Jersey. We've put forward a plan, a plan to get back to basics in New Jersey, to do the fundamental things that New Jersey state government should be doing and to get government out of the way from those things that it shouldn't be doing, to provide safe streets, to, create, to, to provide an atmosphere in which we can have jobs, reduce taxes and cut spending, get government out of the way, to provide an education system that works for our children, for real children. It is our responsibility as we go through this election process to tell you who we are and what we stand for. It is your responsibility to listen and to vote on June 8th. And when you do, I hope you'll have read my plan for New Jersey's future. I hope you'll look carefully at my background and my experience and the skill that I have, not only to have a vision, but to make that vision a reality. I've proven it. We've done it. We can do it again. We can create a new New Jersey, one for you and one for me one for our children and one for our grandchildren, and in New Jersey we can all be proud of, where there is a job, where there are safe streets, and where our children do get an education. And thank you all very much for taking the time to listen. All right. That's, that's it from here. I want to thank our audience. I want to thank the candidates for a good debate. Thank the chamber for hosting this debate, co-hosting it with NJN. There will be one more debate before the primary election, one more televised debate on NJN. The primary is four weeks from tonight. I'm Michael Aaron from Whippany. We're gonna go back to the studio now and Kent Manahan. Kent? Well, Michael, I guess we all know how important time is in television land. There never is enough of it. I guess that debate could have gone on for a bit longer. We heard the candidates tonight talk about how they would deal with New Jersey's economic problems, uh, social problems involving education, 
and crime and how they would deal with environmental problems. We heard James Woolwork say over and over again tonight that he's the businessman candidate. I guess uh, the only person we've heard recently say that more was Ross Perot when he was campaigning for president. We also heard Chrissy Whitman said that she's the candidate who believes in less government, and Carrie Edwards saying that he is the proven leader among the candidates, the man who can run New Jersey because he's qualified to do so. Well, while the candidates were debating tonight, we were here in our Trenton studios taking copious notes uh, in our notepads. I'm here with Cliff Zukin of the Eagleton Institute and David Revovich of Ryder College. And uh, gentlemen, uh, to begin with, where we started, I guess, uh, a little earlier tonight, about an hour and, and 20 minutes or so ago. Who won tonight's debate? I think they finished about where they started, and that definitely benefits Mrs. Whitman. I think she had an easier job in that all she had to do is not make mistakes, and I think she did a very good job of being articulate, of being well prepared, and David, one thing that surprised me about this was how aggressive she was in response when she was attacked by both Walwork and by Edwards, she fired right back with specifics and was very good at setting the agenda. Right, she did that in a couple of ways, actually. I mean, one, Whitman did demonstrate some fluency on the issues, a, a, a topic on which she might have been vulnerable. She also succeeded in twisting much of the discussion back to her own positions and her own strengths, so that when Edwards offered an attack about education, she spoke about her own experiences, the experiences of her own family, and how she might benefit the state. She didn't take the bait. That was so thrown out by the Edwards. I guess what you're saying is that Whitman then yeah, was yeah. the best prepared of the candidates. Is that a little easier to do for her because she's been at it longer and also because she is ahead? Well, no, I don't think so because I think Carrie Edwards has been at it for a long time too. Um, but what I thought again was interesting was her strategy in not taking any stuff from anybody in coming right out. It was a very masterful performance to be able to turn being wealthy into saying you shouldn't make class a divisive issue or when asked about crime which should be Kerry Edwards issue because he was the attorney general for her to set the agenda and put him on the defensive on that question um, she was very very well prepared to handle all the issues that were going to come up including the farmland assessment and other things right. she'd been criticized on. That's a good point, but maybe we're also saying here that Edwards, in his attack of Whitman, wasn't direct enough. Maybe he really should have put the gauntlet down and said, look, let's be candid. I served as AG, I served as chief counsel to the governor, I served in the state legislature. Christy Todd Whitman, where did you really serve? Do you really have the experience and the sense to back up the policy, the general policy perspective that you're espousing? Instead, the criticisms tended to be indirect and obtuse, and Whitman then was able to use those to her advantage. Where do you think Edward scored the highest points tonight? Well, I think on education, the attack of the voucher system of Whitman's uh, support for vouchers was significant. But I, but again, I say that I guess as a as a political scientist, I, I really wonder the extent to which that means a heck of a lot to the voter out there who's choosing a particular candidate. Yes, we're keeping scorecards here. On our scorecard, Edwards would have scored in that particular regard. He might have even scored on the tax issue. Does that get through to the Republican voter? I'm not so sure. I think not. I think the debates are for those people who view it tonight was the first chance to see all the three candidates live. And in that sense, what people come away with from televised Our debates... general impressions? Style. Yes, general impression. It's not what they say so much as how, how they, they say, say it. it. That's yeah. right. And in that sense, I mean, Whitman did again address a potential liability and something that Edwards has attacked her on. Does Christy Todd Whitman look gubernatorial? She did look gubernatorial this evening. Well, well that's... Uh, let's bring in Jim Woolwork, though, here. Did he do what he had to do tonight? Did he, did he come forward uh, from among the pack? No, again, I think he finished probably where he started. I think he gave his clear message out. You know, I don't know how many questions he answered that Michael Aaron asked that said, I'm a businessman, regardless of what the question was. We, we've all acknowledged that in the ads that we've seen of his, that they've been pretty strong. Now, the other two candidates are due out with their paid uh, televised ads uh, as of tomorrow. We've seen a little bit of, of Woolworks ads already, and they've been very strong. But you don't think he measured up to yeah, that Well, I, th I think uh, his ads and his performance tonight play to a core constituency in the Republican Party, the conservative wing. Uh, I'll use the term fluency once again, though I think what some folks would want to see tonight, again, is not necessarily specific policy positions, but general fluency on the issues. And Mr. Woolworth's theme was the same rather narrow one, and it might have cost him this evening. I think that's so. I think he didn't discuss a wide range of issues, but kept trying to refocus it. So in that sense, I don't think he gained any new supporters or got any new ground. 
I think we have to also be conscious that there are going to be about 350,000 people who vote in the Republican primary, and the viewership tonight is going to be measured probably in tens of thousands, which means that how this is played is really, I mean, the next big thing is how does this get played in the newspapers tomorrow? tomorrow? Because in this state, of course, we all know that the newspapers are so important. Uh, uh, tomorrow's headlines That's could right. make or break these candidates with the specifics yeah. of what was talked about tonight. So what are the headlines going to say tomorrow? I was going to ask David that. What yeah. do you think? I was going to put him on the spot. <laughs> no, scandals the in tonight. Yeah, no scandals in, in, tonight's, uh, in tonight's debate. I, I, I think that the, the headlines will suggest what we're suggesting here this evening, that at best it was a wash which advantage, advantages Miss Whitman significantly. We didn't get the bombshell from the Edwards campaign that we might have anticipated. Again, I, I feel it's because uh, Carrie is trapped as a, re, as a progressive Republican, which might play well in a general election, but just hasn't caught on in this particular campaign. In fact, he's even distanced himself from that uh, progressive Republican tradition. Well, he's distanced himself and is now trying to embrace it again. He has changed his tactics to a bit. Yeah. But <clears throat> to a certain extent, Kerry Edwards' message tonight over and over that he wanted to get out. First, his themes of jobs and crime and education. He did get out, but it was sort of disjoint because they were talked about separately. The other message that he wanted to get out, which he said bluntly two or three times, is you don't understand to Christine Whitman on uh, a wide variety of issues, education, on crime, on taxes. And, and, the budget, right, and the budget, and the budget, and in terms of style, forgetting substance again, forgetting the specifics of the response, but in style, what she said tonight is, "I do understand if you were watching this," and that she was able to come back with articulate positions. And the Edwards line that I have a plan, and he does have a plan. It's an impressive plan. It's an impressive document yeah. addressing those three particular areas, but that doesn't sell on TV. Uh, w people want to hear the specifics of a, of a plan stated succinctly in a way that resonates to them at a personal level. So, and I so think we could have seen more So is the place to begin there. to do that then tomorrow with the campaign ads that will be unveiled? And, and what, what could we expect to see, do you think, gentlemen? I think we expect Christy Whitman to go positive, uh, to solidify as support runner. as the front runner and to shape her image. And I think it's very important for us all to remember that there are two tiers in this electorate. There's maybe half of those who are going to vote have been following it through newspapers and have decided, and that's what pollsters measure. And there's this 35 to 40 percent who are undecided. They are not undecided because they know a lot about both candidates, and, or all three candidates, and can't figure out who to vote for. They're undecided because they know so little about them. And that's where the television advertising is the, takes us to the next level. So the question is, what do they focus on in their ads? Do Edwards and Walwork have to go negative against Whitman? And I would suggest they probably do well, with, if they with were only a few weeks left. It would seem well, it that they to have and to. I think Edward says something like this, this and we haven't you know, seen the seen the the ads. But I think Edward says something like this: Christy Todd Whitman is weak on crime. She's fuzzy on education, and she'll wait to cut taxes. The person to be the next governor of New Jersey is Carrie Edwards Blank. And I think we're going to see that for the next several weeks. In the short weeks. time that we have left, it still is early yet, though, isn't it? With only about uh, three and a half, little more than three and a half weeks to go. It's early, but it's in also the sense late. Of the electorate. It is also late in the sense that Republican primaries, Democratic primaries are largely invisible in the state. It is very hard with a limited amount of money to spend on TV to make a big difference, even if you have three or four weeks. It is very hard because the other candidates are on and working themselves. Cliff, what we're not seeing here is a wedge issue manifest itself. There are really That's not point, significant David. differences between uh, particularly Whitman and, and Edwards. And when they, the candidates had the opportunity tonight to map out those differences, it was even difficult to read. Right. Yeah, I, the, thought, I thought Michael Aaron should get combat paid enough for <laughs> trying to get them to get he specific on things. And we will pass right. that on to him tomorrow. Well, thank you very much, David and Cliff, for being with us this evening. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you along the campaign trail. And of course, uh, we want to invite you to be joining us on NJN News tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to wrap up complete coverage of tonight's Republican gubernatorial debate on the news tomorrow night and tell you that this program will be rebroadcast tomorrow afternoon at 4.30. Now, the next debate among the Republican contenders is set for later this month on May 26th. And as always, for the latest development and all that happens in New Jersey, tune in to NJN News. I'm Kent Matahan, and thank you very much for being with us. Good night.